This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, the first team of the second part, Fluency Lighting Technologies. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kristen Denault, a PhD student in materials. This is Jared Hume, a PhD student in electrical engineering, and Daniel Moncayo, a PhD student in economics. And we are Fluency Lighting Technologies. At the forefront of energy efficient illumination, we're creating revolutionary lighting technologies to better serve our customers and the environment. We're using a new approach to generate white light, a laser diode, just like this laser pointer here, except hundreds of times brighter. Our fluency laser lamps have the potential to, to deliver high quality, high brightness illumination using 50% less energy than competing technologies. These high power lamps have applications in aircraft exterior landing lights, surgical lighting, and stadium lighting, to name only a few. So why should we care about energy efficient lighting? Lighting is the number one source of electricity use in the industrial architecture and outdoor sectors. In the US, this accounts for 460 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, or $55 billion per year. A large percentage of these lights are the high power directional applications like I mentioned previously. If we can replace only 10% of these with our fluency laser lamps, this would be a savings of 23 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, enough energy to power all of the homes, workplaces, and industry of Los Angeles for an entire year. So how does a laser lamp work? Here, Jared has a small scale proof of concept demonstration. At full capacity, our lamps will be producing 100 times this amount of light. Within our lamps, there are electronics to power the laser diodes, which are embedded in a heat sink material. The, high, the power and the light output of our lamps will depend on the number of laser diodes that we're using for each. The lasers emit blue light, which combines with the phosphor material and is converted to white light and extracted from the device. Our patented laser pumped phosphor technology that was developed here at UCSB allows us to deliver highly efficient light in compact, lightweight designs with long operating lifetimes, instantaneous turn on time, and using environmentally friendly materials. So within the value chain, our company will focus on innovation and implementation of this new lighting technology. We will source from our suppliers the input materials of lasers, phosphors, heat sink materials, and the electrical and optical components. Fluency lighting technologies will then focus on innovative light engine designs and optics and fixture designs, all of the internal workings of light generation and extraction within the lamp while building our intellectual property portfolio. We will then outsource our manufacturing and assembly of lamps to facilities that currently manufacture LED fixtures since they will have the expertise and equipment um, that will be similar to manufacturing our lamps. And in order to get our product into the market, we plan to first 
test these in pilot locations by partnering with institutions like Southern California Edison and the Department of Energy, who have programs to help implement energy efficient technologies. And then once our lamps are proven in our pilot locations, we will distribute them via um, local and regional distributors that are already in place. So competing technologies in this area are HID, or high intensity discharge lamps, and high power LED lamps that are beginning to penetrate this market. Our lamps can deliver more light using 30% less energy than high power LEDs and 50% less energy than HID lamps. Take, for example, a parking lot using 100,000 watt HID lamps. If we were to replace all of these with our fluency laser lamps, this would be a savings of $47,000 per year in electricity costs with additional savings in maintenance and replacement costs. Our lamps currently have an upfront cost that is competitive to HIDs with a three and a half year, three, three and a half year payback period and a lifetime that is five times as long. These payback periods are similar to the high power LEDs that have already begun to penetrate this market. And this is because our customers are using large volumes of lamps that are constantly in use, consuming massive amounts of energy. And so they can really see the energy savings that are possible and are more amenable to these longer payback periods than in the residential sector. So here's a look at the market. In 2011, the total lighting market was valued at $69 billion worldwide, with new installations accounting for 85% and replacements 15%. We're focusing on the industrial, outdoor, and architectural, the high power lighting segment within this and more specifically, the energy efficient illumination sector. This energy efficient segment currently consists of LEDs and is only 14% of the high power market, but is growing rapidly at 30% per year and taking over the competing HID and fluorescent lighting technologies. In 2011, this energy efficient high power market was valued at $3 billion worldwide. Since January of 2014, the US government and governments around the world have been banning inefficient lighting technologies and implementing strict energy efficiency requirements to reduce the global energy consumption. This means that this market is rapidly growing and in 2014 is valued at $6 billion, doubling since 2011, and is projected to reach 22 billion worldwide by 2020. Our financial projections show our first sales in year three with revenues of $45 million by year six. This is a 3% market share of the outdoor sector of the energy efficient high power illumination market within the US, which is where we first intend to uh, market our products. Our timeline and milestones consist of in year one incorporating filing uh, more patents and intellectual property, prototyping and research and development. In year two, we plan to hire engineers to help with the product development, secure a manufacturing contract, and our first pilot location. In year three, we will have our first sales. We'll hire a sales and manufacturing director. And then in year four, we'll scale up our manufacturing and start research and development into new product applications and areas. And then in years five and six, we will diversify into these other market segments and applications. So the founding team consists of myself, a PhD student in materials with a specialization in phosphors for solid state white lighting and experience with intellectual property. Jared Hume, a PhD student in electrical engineering with a specialty in lasers and two years experience in product development and two years experience in mechanical engineering. And Daniel Moncayo, a PhD student in economics with a specialization in market analysis and forecasting, four years of sales experience and financials for three startups. So with that, I'd like to thank you and we are Fluency Lighting Technologies.
confuse you. Are you sitting down? So many questions. Congratulations. Time. <laughs> okay. Um, just a, a couple of comments. First of all, the growth projections for revenue were very aggressive, right? And we just we're talking about hockey sticks: 2.5 million to 45 million in three years is aggressive. So I'd hire a salesperson today. <laughs> just get a little <laughs> running start, okay? Um, the, the thing uh, about your, the, the quality of your light, right? You know, LEDs are great and that's an obvious target for you, but humans like warmth, warm light, right? So we, we act, there's, you know, things about not really liking LEDs and, and the ubiquitous, you know, nature of that market may be stymied by the quality of light in terms of what we like. How does your light source compared to that? Well, we have the ability to change the quality of the light based on the phosphors we use. Um, but they, one of the things to point out is this is not intended to be used in people's homes um, or even in office buildings. So these are... Yeah, I noticed the reference to commercial like parking lots, right? Right. So people don't care <laughs> as much about the color quality of their outdoor lights in general, I would say. Yeah, and again, not to be, you know, I would disagree that we have a new bridge in San Francisco. Certainly we want it better. Okay. Well, we, I just and, say we. And that's we have, something we can work on. We yes. have a new bridge in the Bay Area, and I forget the number, but a significant amount was invested in the lighting, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. It's like a nightclub. You know, when I walk onto a plane on Virgin America, I love the lighting. I hate it on United Airlines, right? <laughs> so I would be careful about that, um, that human element in the quality of the light. So it is possible to tune the color temperature of our lights um, by changing the phosphor, as Jared said. And this is also possible with LED lights. The problem is that since LED lights were a new technology, they were expensive to begin with. And we have seen the price decrease drastically over the past 10 years. And so one thing that's holding LEDs back from those warmer, nicer color temperatures is just the price. Yeah. So as the price of these continues to decrease, we can also get to those warmer, nicer looking lights. So is, is your cost of goods competitive, in, like in year three? Or will you be competitive at a certain, at that $2.5 million sales number, at that volume, are you price competitive on your cost of goods sold to LEDs? So we modeled this having a similar cost of goods sold as LEDs. And we also expect that laser diodes will follow the same trends as LEDs where the efficiency will increase and the price will decrease over time as more research goes into this area. Okay, um, you know, the megawatt story is a great story. I mean, we all want to save, we'll save more money than we ever needed by, you know, converting electricity into megawatts. Like that part. Uh, you've got a factor of three efficiency pickup from the LED in your, in your scale. That's really cool. Um, you guys are really bright and, and energetic. You know, how the hell are you going to compete with Westinghouse, Edison, these people who are making millions of light bulbs on a daily basis? You know, what, what gives you the moxie to step up and say you could do it better? So the, the biggest thing is that we are small and nimble. And if they wanted to do something that, um, like, we're doing, they'll probably hire us to do it. So <laughs> by, I'm being straight up. So, so you have people here from one of the best universities. In fact, Solid State Lighting was, was born here, right? And, and these two guys, you know, I'm the economist. I just knew money. But these guys um, have an amazing background to do this. And, and that is our sole competitive advantage versus all these people. Um, and the fact that we can, you know, push forward really fast. And we truly believe that it's not whether you can do it, it's whether you can be the best at it. And we're planning on doing that. All right, so your pat, there's a patent, a couple of patents from UCSB, so that I assume that you have to license the patents. Can you talk about uh, where you are in that process, what it's going to cost to license, and, uh, you know, the whole legal hurdles that you have to do? With? Sure. So we've been talking with the technology transfer office here at UCSB about the patents. They are both available for us to license. And um, we are in the workings of signing a letter of intent to license them. So we haven't talked specifically about license agreements yet. But as far as costs, right now we're looking at a couple thousand dollars, probably $5,000 over the next six months for patent costs. 
And, and so, what, what aspect of the product do, do the patents cover? So there are two patents. The first patent is, these are both patents pending right now. Um, the first one is written very broadly, so it, it just covers using a laser with a phosphor material to produce white light for general illumination. And the second patent focuses more on applications in stadiums. And has anyone else tried to license those patents? Any other companies? Um, I don't think we're allowed to know that information um, from the Technology Transfer Office, so they haven't they haven't said anything about that. But um, the fact that they're available for us to yeah. license, I suppose, means that nobody else has. Um, interest in it yet. Does that scare you, that no one else is interested in it? Um, they do typically approach the inventors first and, and allow them to have kind of a first run at things if it looks like things are going to go somewhere. And additionally, so um, the first patent, they pursued it by themselves. So generally speaking, before they file the, the, from a temporary to a permanent application, um, they, they try to find somebody who is going to license it beforehand to offset the cost. In the case of the first patent, they've already filed a patent. So they're, they're very confident that this technology is going to be very valuable. And we're lucky to be one of the first ones to, to be in the queue. So uh, I'm assuming that as a part of that license, there's, there's probably some sort of royalty to the university. Uh, and you already mentioned that the prices are going to come down. Obviously, this is a competitive space. I guess I'm concerned about the margins here, right? You're going to have, it's a manufacturing process. I don't know how complicated it is, but there's going to be yield issues. There's cost of goods, obviously. You're talking about outsourcing. So the outsourced manufacturer is going to have a markup. You're going to potentially have a royalty. Uh, you know, as prices come down, is there enough room to have a business there? Take that. So, <clears throat> in answering your question and also Ron's, um, our projections are actually quite conservative, and we have been very, very careful, careful about how we, we do them. Um, first of all, um, our revenues are very alike to the ones um, that we see in very similar companies. In fact, a very successful LED manufacturer or lamps of similar specs to ours shared um, their, their lifetime revenue, how it looked like. And just like ours, we're actually taking their numbers and making them a little smaller. Um, so they're flat on target. And in fact, um, this company, uh, they also sell, red, they only sell to the retrofit market. They haven't even taken the new installation market. And they're just in California. <laughs> so we, we are extremely conservative with, with uh, the assumptions that we made to come up with these revenue um, these um, revenue estimates, and at the same time, we've looked really closely at similar companies and their statements and their financials and all their numbers. And yes, I mean, you can see that our revenues are 45 million with 4 million in profits, and that incurs a lot of cost. Okay, of goods, I mean, but. you don't have any revenue, so that this is all speculation, you know. So, I think the fundamental question is that you guys are out of the material sciences lab. We've got this hundred million dollar machine over there that basically puts the atoms on the substrata that is the fundamental science that drives this technology for you. What are you going to do when you don't have access to that machine and the next generation of product comes along? I mean, where are you going to get the capital to invest what the university has already invested in this project? So we, um, in our analysis, we don't have many fixed costs with equipment. Um, since we're sourcing the laser diodes, which are the really the heaviest part of equipment-wise, you know, you need a clean room, lots of money there, but we're, we're not manufacturing that ourselves. And so we don't have very large fixed costs for equipment. And a lot of the expensive equipment that you do need that's very large for testing lamps and fixtures, um, there's a lighting laboratory in Anaheim that we've been in contact with to do those types of measurements using their large expensive equipment. And we have to call time there. Thank you very much, Boots.
I'm Laura Eddy. This is my co-founder, Laura Johnson. We're Salty Girl Seafood. Seafood is a $400 billion global industry. It's riddled with fraud, and it's ripe for disruption. Our innovative solution is a platform-based approach to seafood distribution. Salty Girl Seafood is a sustainable seafood distribution company that bypasses the traditional supply chain to ship seafood directly from fishermen to chefs, ensuring a fully traceable, guaranteed sustainable seafood product. Laura and I have spent the past eight years or so working in the commercial fishing, commercial fishing and marine industries. We have over a thousand days at sea between the two of us, and most recently we spent time working aboard fishing vessels in Alaska. Our uh, marketing director, Gina Oriyama, and our web developer, Andrea Sagan, also have um, extensive, industry, ex extensive industry experience in the marine world. So it's because of our strong ties to the fishing industry that we were so surprised to learn that one third of all seafood sold in the US is mislabeled. And even more surprising for those of us here in Southern California, the highest rates of mislabeling were found here in our region, 52%. So, seafood fraud in the form of mislabeling presents three major problems for the consumer. Price, freshness, and sustainability. Oftentimes, you have a low-value species being substituted for a high-value species, meaning that you're paying a price premium for a low-value low product. If you don't know when your seafood was caught, you can't know how fresh it is. And if you don't know how and from where it was caught, you have no guarantee that it's a sus sustainable product. So, why does this happen? The traditional seafood supply chain is old and highly fragmented, and your seafood is passed through many hands along the supply chain. And it's unclear at what point this mislabeling occurs. Um, and it can be intentional or unintentional. And so we can't just bypass, we can't just cut out one person in the supply chain in order to solve the problem. Meet chef Stephanie Izzard. Stephanie is the head chef at a top seafood restaurant in Chicago. And it's important to both Stephanie and to her customer that she sources her product sustainably and traceably. But being that she's in Chicago, she can't just go down to the docks and source her fish direct from the fishermen the way that she would like to, the way that she sources her potatoes direct from her farmer. So Stephanie is stuck working in that traditional seafood supply chain. So when Stephanie wants to know a little bit of information about her seafood products, she wakes up early in the morning at 6 AM and she starts placing calls back through the seafood supply chain. She places a call to her distributor in Iowa, who picks up the phone and has to call the wholesaler in California. And he doesn't have the information, so he has to call the shoreside processor in Seattle. And by the time she spent all of this energy find, trying to find out this information, she still has very little, if any, reliable information about her seafood. This is, as we found through 42 in-depth interviews with, cut, with chefs all over the country, a growing problem, not just for Stephanie, but for these chefs all over our nation. So Salty Girl Solution addresses the three problems associated with seafood mislabeling in three ways. First, we partner with NGOs at the source to guarantee that we have a fully sustainable product. Second, we cut out that, dis that traditional dis supply chain that lends itself so well to mislabeling, ensuring we have a fully traceable product. And lastly, we ship direct from our network of fishermen to our chefs to ensure that our product is on average two days fresher than if it had moved through the traditional seafood supply chain. So what does this look like for our network of fishermen and our network of chefs? Well, meet Jeremiah O'Brien. Jeremiah is an albacore tuna fisherman out of Morro Bay, California, and he is one of Salty Girl Seafood's early adopters, one of our first fishermen. And we've worked with Jeremiah to get him uh, uh, vetted through the Salty Girl system. So he knows how to maintain our quality standards and work within the Salty Girl system. And Jeremiah lets us know before he goes fishing how much fish he wants to sell through our online marketplace. And when he comes back to the dock, he is able to send us all of the information and photographs of his fish. And all he has to do is find out where it's going and ship it straight to our chef like Stephanie. So he puts that fish in a box, puts it on a FedEx truck bound for the chef, and it's on its way. So from the restaurant perspective, Stephanie has already been able to log on to our marketplace and see Jeremiah's Morro Bay tuna online. She's placed her order, and her box from Jeremiah arrives one day after it was landed. And she has all of that information readily available associated with her product that was so hard for her to find in that traditional seafood supply chain. 
So she can choose whether she wants to share that information via her menu or, her, or QR codes with her customers. So Salty Girl Seafood Solution is very similar to other online marketplaces like Uber and Airbnb who have had to build a network of users and producers. And in our case, that's fishermen and chefs. So we have to do what they've done, which is build that strong trust within their system. And in doing so, working with our chefs like Stephanie and our early fishermen like Jeremiah will begin to grow the, the trust in our system and help to grow our business exponentially. So Salty Girl is also a very timely opportunity. Seafood consumption in the United States has been increasing over the last 30 years and is projected to double before the year 2050. Within that, sales of sustainable seafood have also increased. Just last year, processors reported a doubling in their sales of, of sustainable products. So the global seafood market is a $400 billion industry, and our company seeks to address the US demand for seafood, which is a $20 billion industry. Of that, $8.9 billion of seafood is sold in restaurants each year, and sustainable, se sustainable seafood sales accounts for a smaller subset of that at $2.6 billion. Our company seeks to capture 2% of the market share, which would be $52.5 million of seafood sales each year, and we believe this is a reasonable goal because some of our closest competitors have been able to do so in under three years of establishing their businesses. So Salty Girl's competitors are any company that sells seafood to restaurants and retailers in the United States. And as you can imagine, there are several companies that exist that do this. However, none of them offer the same array of benefits that Salty Girl does, particularly on those three value propositions of freshness and quality, sustainability, and traceability. Additionally, because we are a platform-based distribution company, we don't actually hold any inventory, which is different from all of our competitors. So as seafood travels through the traditional supply chain, there are many players who each take a portion of the markup value. And because Salty Girl is able to eliminate the middlemen, we're able to capture 73% of that markup. So th this allows us to incentivize fishermen to work directly with us and do some minimal processing because we offer them a higher price for their products. In turn, we're also able to offer competitive pricing to our restaurant and retail customers. This is the cost breakdown per pound of salty girl seafood fish when we're considering Jeremiah's albacore tuna. And so you can see, after you remove the price that we pay Jeremiah for his tuna, as well as the cost of packaging and traceability, we can still capture a large portion of the profits and potentially be able to cover our op operational costs and still make a profit. So we've projected out our sales over a 10-year time span to actually capture that 2% market share. And so this is looking at increasing our sales at 50% each year. And what does this mean for Salty Girl? This means that in year five, we have to have 100 fishermen in our network, as well as 100 chefs that are willing to source directly from us. Another differentiating factor are our key partners, who are large NGOs like Conservation International, who work internationally in fisheries around the globe. And so Nora and I have been working, at, working in the Galapagos lobster fishery for the last year and a half. And while we were down there just last summer, we were approached by one of the directors who sought us out to talk about market-based solution to support their fishing communities and fishermen. And so, um, he stressed to us that they've been looking for a partner um, to be able to provide access to markets abroad to support and tell the story of their artisanal fishermen. So we're actually headed down there tomorrow to host a workshop, as well as to formalize our partnership between CI and Conservation International. We also have our technical advisory board, who are five individuals who are leaders in their industry, um, such as business, fisheries, and nonprofit world. And these individuals are committed to helping us develop our business. So additionally, right now, we have two angel investors who are currently committed to helping us um, succeed with our business. We also have eight fishermen, like Jeremiah, who have committed to actually selling their products through Salty Girl, as well as six chefs, like Stephanie Izzard, who have already placed orders with our company. And some of these orders are on the order of 10,000 pounds of seafood at once. And so our team is committed to actually implementing our innovative solution to transform the way that the seafood industry currently works. 
and we're working right now to build our network of fishermen as well as our network of chefs to be able to tap into that $400 billion global seafood industry. Thank you very much. We would, we'll take any questions that you have at this time. <laughs> Before we go to you're Q, I, I have to say that's never ever happened where the very last syllable was said right at 10 minutes. Q&A. I'm just wondering if there's any regulatory issues around you start what you're doing up since you're handling, <laughs> in the process of handling food. So there are regulations um, on health standards and things for when you're handling seafood. But our uh, industry and our business are really interesting because there's actually legislation on the floor right now um, to impart harsher sanctions for people who are caught with um, seafood, with fraudulently labeled seafood. And restaurants are now more and more incentivized to find a place where, uh, find a distributor who can provide them with a guaranteed traceable product. So in our- So the regulations industry, are in your favor right now? The regulations are in our favor, yes. Yeah, and we do have to have certain things like licensing to be able to purchase and sell seafood. And so we're working on acquiring that right now for the state of California. What? If you're a restaurant, you want salmon, you want tuna, you want, you know, sea bass. Those fishermen, you know, basically one guy focuses on tuna, one guy focuses on sea bass. At a processor, you can get it all. You can sort of order all three, four, five shellfish and everything together. You'd have to, seems like your chef has to put in, you know, five, six different orders and it's seafood if something doesn't come in. I, mean, I just, it seems like a very logistical, uh, logistically difficult um, algorithm to, to finesse. Sure, it is a very logistically intensive business, absolutely. Um, we've found, we've done this extensive customer development, 43 as of last night, we actually had an interview last night, um, interviews with chefs, and we have found them to be really receptive, especially chefs who are mindful of finding a sustainable, traceable, or quality product, they're often sourcing from a number of distributors in order to meet their seafood needs. So they're not actually going through a big distributor to source you know, 10 different species. They're, uh, they're working with a number of distributors who are adept at sourcing a number, a, a few species for them, or one key species for them, or something like that. And they still need standard sizes of all of the seafood products. So even if they do sell several different types, like cod and salmon, they still need at least 20 to 50 pounds of each of those species. And so that's enough to actually source from several different fishermen. It, 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 it appeared that the DNA test was one of your differentiations, right? So can you just talk a little about how that works and is there IP around that? Sure, so um, the, DNA the DNA is more of a self-auditing piece, or a third-party auditing piece, rather, that we've built into our model because we know that really no one else is doing that out there. The way that we have it now, it's 1% of our seafood is tested by a third-party um, DNA lab, and it's a really simple process. Our chefs, once they receive our seafood, um, just take a clip and send it out to the lab. Um, it's fairly inexpensive, and there's this awesome fish barcode DNA project that's going on, so it's actually relatively simple for them to ID fish via DNA. Yeah, it's becoming more and more common, so the, the cost is coming down, but it's not a technology that we're developing. So I can see um, the real benefit in uh, the brand identification with the salty girl, with the species, the ride, you get all the fish, the QoS, right, for the customer. That That's all really cool. Uh, do you really know the fish business? Uh, you know, it's sort of been mob cash business for a long time. Is that, is that, you guys don't appear to me as that kind of people. <laughs> um, and, and, and I have one other suggestion is that when you guys put that slide up there that says co-founder, I think you ought to call yourselves co-flounders. <laughs> but you know, there are some challenges in, in trying to unseat a, an established distribution channel. I mean, those profits are probably there for a reason. Um, you know, so what's your experience actually selling something? 
So we've been talking a lot about, you know, our business model is based on this network that we're growing, right? Much like Uber and Airbnb, as we referenced in our talk. Um, and our benefit is that we do have that time in the industry. Laura and I, I grew up in a fishing town. Um, Laura and I have both worked in the industry all over the country and now the world. Um, so we are able to connect with fishermen and we knew that there was a need. We knew from our talks with fishermen all over the country that they were looking for a way to direct market their problem or their product, sorry. So you have this, this whole group of small scale fishermen which represent 50% of employed fishermen in the world. And you have chefs that want this awesome artisanal product. And the fishermen come in, they've been fishing all day, and it's just, it's too much to be a fisherman and be direct marketing. So instead of um, them doing it, we're just inserting ourselves in that role. And there is, a, there are a lot of logistics for us to handle on that end, and that's why we're looking to start small and start piloting with those early adopters that we've already established. <coughs> I think there's something to be said for, we've had several fishermen actually come and seek us out and want to work directly with us because they're really unhappy with how the traditional supply chain functions right now. Um, and I guess another thing to remember is that we are also looking at international fisheries, so there aren't currently distributors working with some of those individuals. Any more questions? How All right, about, thank you, Salty. Oh, one more, Mike. One more, go. How about barriers to entry for competitors? I mean, if, if the one differentiation is a DNA test, and that's third party, right? What else, what else are we looking at in terms of? That's a really great question. Um, we were actually just reading this interesting article about online marketplaces and barriers to entry. And for, so for one, it kind of um, reflects on the previous question about the seafood industry is kind of a big, scary industry. It's kind of a hard industry to break into. Um, it's hard to, to talk to fishermen. It's really hard to develop trust with, with fishermen. And likewise with chefs, um, Laura and I have had the benefit of going to meet with fishermen that we've known forever and meet with leaders in the community, Jeremiah and one in particular. We've managed to establish this great trust right off the bat. So, you know, not every Joe down the pike is gonna be able to do that. Um, it's also a kind of a heavy industry to get involved in. Um, and then when we're talking about developing this network, you know, you're talking about onboarding fishermen with the cost of doing that. It's, it's potentially costly, but um, we think that the payoff is gonna be really great. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Salty Joe. We're Shadow Maps, a location improvement service for mobile. There's a large and growing number of smartphone apps that rely on GPS for accuracy. How, for example, you leave your phone in a taxi and use a Find My Phone app to figure out where it is. But it's only good to a city block level accuracy and you play a game of guess the right taxi in a city. And once you get a new phone and swear off the taxis, you're still having issues with inaccurate GPS because you're looking for your Uber ride on the wrong side of the street. And in the case of emergency 911, the FCC has mandated that all cell phone carriers have to report your location within 50 meters to emergency dispatchers. But there's a specific problem with GPS in cities. It's called the shadowing problem. Tall buildings block GPS signals. These, like, yes. These tall buildings block GPS signals by casting shadows and preventing your GPS from working properly. These, these, can, these shadows lead to errors up to 100 feet, most often seen as cross street errors in areas like downtown San Francisco. GPS reports us across the street inside a building as opposed to our location at the blue marker here. Now just last week I was up there and this is the path GPS thought I was walking. You might think I had a pretty great Friday night given the zigzags and everything. <laughs> but this was a Wednesday afternoon and I was walking on the path the entire way. So, with knowledge of where the buildings are, where the satellites are, and where these shadows occur, we can improve this by a factor of 10, fixing this problem. Now let me show you the value of this improvement. Imagine you're walking down State Street in Santa Barbara on a hot afternoon. You receive a half-price coupon for your favorite drink at Starbucks. 
You look up from your phone and all of a sudden you realize you're right in front of the door. That's the value of storefront accuracy. And that's what our technology can provide advertisers. They can target ads at the right place at the right time. Let me introduce my colleague Andrew who's going to tell us just how we can make this happen. Thanks, Dayton. The central component in our system is a software development kit, or SDK, which is embedded in mobile apps and is distributed to many mobile devices. This allows us to crowdsource, crowdsource GPS shadowing data, which is available on every mobile device but is simply thrown away at present. Our cloud-based services then convert this data into 3D maps of cities. These maps are continually updated as more and more data becomes available. Once we have our 3D maps, we can do real-time positioning improvement. More specifically, if you have one mobile device transmitting GPS shadowing data, we can then compare that data to our 3D maps and provide real-time positioning improvement in the other direction back down to the mobile device. Our patented technology provides a low-cost, real-time, scalable, and software-only solution to the GPS shadowing problem. We field tested our technology locally at UCSB campus, and those results have been published in three academic peer-reviewed papers. More recently, we've tested our system in downtown Santa Barbara. The video I'm about to show you is from a walk I took up State Street the other day. The red circle is a position in uncertainty as reported by the standalone GPS, and the blue circle is the position estimate that we provide. Now the true path is in yellow, and you can see that we track that very well. The red circle, the standalone GPS estimate, diverges across the street to 50 feet of air right away. As we approach the intersection, satellite visibility improves, and standalone GPS uh, satellite uh, uh, performance Im improves as well. We then see a second cross street air as we go in down the second urban canyon. So just in a matter of 30 seconds in downtown Santa Barbara, we're able to correct for two cross street airs. Now Santa Barbara is not known for having very tall buildings. When we field test our algorithms in larger cities, such as San Francisco or New York, we expect our algorithms to work even better. Let's go over the competitive landscape. Now, if you use GPS in cities, outdoors, as I've just shown, accuracy can be pretty bad. Our competitors, Navizon, Skyhook, e -Ride, and Telenav, all use combinations of Wi-Fi, cellular, and GPS to improve positioning outdoors, but more specifically, indoors. However, because they do not use 3D maps, they cannot address the GPS shadowing problem. As a result, we provide much better location estimation outdoors than they do. In addition, because our solution is software only, we can, we can supplement any native positioning technology that's being used on the device, including Wi-Fi or cellular. Our product development timeline goes as this. We've developed our initial proof of concept and we've, we've filed a provisional patent through the UCSB Tech Transfer Office. That protects our core IP, or the, the, the core IP. We will continue our, our, we will continue the, our uh, R&D going forward in our IP development in order to maintain our competitive advantage. The next step is to develop a simple phone finder app. This is something that's gonna have relatively quick turnaround, just in a period of six months, that's for development, testing, and release. And this is something that we're gonna distribute to the public through the Google Play Store. This allows us to crowdsource GPS data from cities. It allows us to test our algorithms and our implementation of them. And it also permits us, crucially, to demonstrate our system in real time to potential customers. Concurrently, we'll be working on our main, developing our main service. And the Phone Finder app will allow us to accelerate this process. We anticipate in the first quarter of 2015 of having our SDK deployed and the backend services that support it completely ready. The question is, how do we take this thing to market? Shadow Maps has applications in a number of target markets, including car services, location-aware social apps such as Foursquare and Facebook, apps to help you find what you're looking for, or in the more interesting case, when you need to be found. And the largest target market is location-targeted advertising. Now, the location-targeted advertising market is a small subsection of the $11.4 billion mobile advertising market this year, but it's going to triple in the next few years to $15.7 billion, overtaking 
the non-location targeted part of this market. As a result, agencies are going to be demanding more accurate location information from the ad networks. Now these ad networks manage the supply and demand of ads through the publishers, the apps on your smartphone, to the end user. We're targeting the ad networks because they manage the distribution of the SDK that Andrew had mentioned, as well as the location information to and from the end user. Now, by partnering with the ad networks, we're able to gain access to the existing distribution channel that they have for our SDK while providing them with the location information they need. Our sales, forecast is, our sales forecast shows rapid growth with gross margins in excess of 90% by year two. This is possible because our cloud computation and storage is the only main cost of service. Our pricing model is based on the Google Maps API charging per location improvement. Given our development timeline, we expect our first customer in quarter three with profitability in quarter five. We've already started the conversation in working towards our first partnerships by talking with the general manager of ThinkNear and data scientists at Uber. With Traction, our ultimate goal is to integrate Shadow Maps with a mobile operating system such as Android or iOS, providing location improvement natively on all 1.4 billion smartphones worldwide. This is reasonable because even in the last year, Waze was bought for just around a billion dollars by Google and Wi-Fi Slam, an indoor location improvement company, was bought by Apple for 20 million just two years after being founded. We have a strong, technically inclined team with Jason, Andrew, and Danny are all brilliant engineers with academic and industry experience in localization, mapping, and wireless networks. Our tech advisor is UCSB professor Madov, who is one of the top cited authors in his field of computer science. Our business advisor is David Smokowski, who's founded numerous successful companies and is also a former executive at Boeing Ventures and Berkshire Hathaway. I bring my marketing and business development experience from working with a social networking app that raised 750,000 just last year. So remember, GPS has 100 foot errors in cities. Shadow Maps can improve this by a factor of 10, enabling storefront accuracy. We have a large and growing market that's going to triple in the next few years and we have the strong technical team to build, develop, and take this technology to market. Thank you for your attention. Vote for Shadow Maps. Shut up, guys. So uh, are you, you, is your algorithm uh, direct measurement or is it extrapolation off of um, your 3D map, noise cancellation? What, what, how are you doing that? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? How, how are you calculating your, uh, your location if it's not direct GPS? Sure. Yeah, I can answer that question. Jason, could you go to the slide, yeah. please? So basically what we're doing is um, we're, we're taking advantage of the fact that the, the shadows, the shadow zones of buildings, um, with respect to different satellites are, can be, are known at the, at the device. So if you look at this figure here, if say you have uh, two different buildings, right, and two different satellites, you'll see these, these two shadows. And there's going to be there basically a bunch of different regions where you would either see one satellite and the other, or the other satellite and not the other, or where you'd see both or neither. And you can detect this at the, at the phone. Like you can measure the signal strength to the satellite and try to see what region you're in. So um, that's, that's how we provide the location improvement. Um, for, specifically, if this was your location fix, you may have uncertainty. Um, you may not know exactly where you are. But depending on what you measure, you, you could be either right here or right here, right here. Yeah. So you're triangulating. And, and one other point about that is that at any given time, there's around 18 to 20 satellites that your phone can see, not just two. So yeah. the regions are much more complex than are described here. So right now, every phone keeps track of that information, which satellites it's communicating with, where yes. it is, and when it's losing and, and gaining those back. And you're yes. saying that information is available on the cloud right now? It's, it's available on the device. It's available through the Google Location API. 
So you guys can be building maps of cities today. You don't need to put anything on a phone to do that. We need to deploy uh, something on the phone to actually allow us to get this data back up to the servers so that we can do our computation. Um, but but to, I think to answer your question, the, the movie that you saw in the middle of the presentation, okay. that was taken from measurements that we built, uh, we built that map based on measurements that the four of us took with our phones. So we have a demo app that does the data gathering now. It's just the full demo okay. for the find the phone is still in development. Yeah, and that took about, that was about 40 hours of walking around downtown Santa Barbara, four people, but um, just logging So data 40 data. hours, four people, you can map most of Santa Barbara. Uh, we mapped about 12 blocks oh, in downtown okay. Santa Barbara around State Street, yeah. Isn't there a better way to get that information? Absolutely, yeah. We'd rather not be walking around ourselves <laughs> because it takes a lot of time. And I mean, it's good to get exercise, but still, um, yeah, what we're doing, that's, that's why we're deploying the Phone Finder app, basically. Right. Um, this, this Phone Finder app would, would allow us to show, hey, look, if you're confused as to where you left your phone, we can tell you uh, that you're within 10 feet, so you can hear it vibrate instead of, you know, it being so far, you know, 100 feet away maybe when you actually go to recover it. Um, and this also allows us to get the data that we need. We can distribute it to, to the general public mm -hmm. over the and, Android Play Store. And what, what have you um, licensed, patented, or um, from UCSB? Is this... Uh, yeah, we're filing the IP through, um, through the Tech Transfer Office, Tech, uh, Technology Industry Alliance, TIA office um, here at UCSB. And right now we have one provisional patent um, that we filed in December. The application is due in December, this December this year, and it can, protects our core mapping algorithms that allow us to do this positioning improvement. And will you have to pay UCSB a license fee for that, I assume? Uh, yes, we, we are still in the beginning negotiations of that, so we haven't finalized the license agreement yet. Any more questions? Going once, twice. My wife said she really liked the idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got a vote. Yeah, she, she has problems finding the Uber cabs across the street. <laughs> I think you're going to have a shopping issue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Shadow Maps. Um, I can tell you that it was a very interesting and animated and spirited discussion down there in the judges' room, and uh, it, it was really entertaining to listen to. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll start with Market Pull, and we'll start with the third place winner. Echo. And third place winner is the team Echo. Okay, in market pull, second place goes to Salty Seafood, Salty Girl Seafood. And for those of you keeping score at home, process of elimination means that Bottle Branders wins first place in the market pull category. Okay, next in the tech push category, um, the judges deliberated at length and decided to award a tie for second. So instead of third place, we'll have two teams tied for second. 2,000 each. And they'll each get 2,000. So if you look in the, in the amounts in the, in the schedule, um, we'll rejiggering that a little bit. So the two teams are Cayuga Biotech and Fluency Lighting Technologies in second place. So that means first place goes to Shadow Maps from Tech Push. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> okay. We have a People's Choice Award selected by all of you, and I'm happy to say the People's Choice Award goes to Salty Girl Seafood. Close. 
the final award presentation tonight is a new one this year, the Ealings Prize, and we're really pleased to have Virgil Ealings here to help us make the award. Now, Virgil has his own um, special way of awarding this. Do you want to explain, Virgil? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh -huh. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, they tell me in business, uh, they've told me a lot of times, uh, business is a combination of skill and luck. I know when I was in business and people looked at our skill, they would say, you guys are really lucky. <clears throat> and so therefore, part of this is business thing is luck. So I have these uh, metal wafers here. Hey, they've got eagles on them. Marked one through six, but due to popular demand, People have asked me to remove one. And guess who it is? <laughs> Here's your wafer. <laughs> they get to keep the dollar, though, right? Uh, he can pretend it's a dollar, but they tell me they're worth more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, somewhere in here we have uh, metal wafers, and somebody, since you guys aren't going to win, you want to pick one? <laughs> and according to my sheet, salty seafood. <laughs> 